Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, my name is Andre Pesh. I'm a director of software engineering at Arista Networks. And this talk is about uh, running OpenStack on top of a VXLAN fabric. Um, I'll let people settle in. Come on in. So this talk really grows out of um, conversations I've had with customers over the past six months um, about you know, how, to, how to run OpenStack over VXLAN. Um, if you don't know about Arista Networks, we're a uh, data center networking company. Our, our infrastructure is at the heart of some of the largest cloud service providers, web companies, large financial institutions, um, and enterprises of the world. And you know, a lot of our customers are interested in OpenStack as an infrastructure on top of which to build their business. Um, and they're also interested in VXLAN and kind of network virtualization in general and the flexibility that that can bring. Apparently, I started too early. Come on in, guys. <laughs> so they're interested in, in VXLAN and, the, and, and network virtualization in general, the flexibility that can bring as part of um, automating and scaling their infrastructure. And so, you know, as, as co authors of the VXLAN spec, um, and as a vendor with uh, the first shipping hardware, uh, uh, hardware switch with VXLAN support, we're often asked kind of how do, you know, how do I run VXLAN on top of, or how do I run OpenStack on top of VXLAN? And so that's really what this talk is about. And this has evolved a lot over the past six months in terms of um, you know, what solutions are available uh, out there in the marketplace. And so really what I want to talk about is what, you know, what can you do today? What are your options? Um, and, uh, and, and what are some areas which still need improvement within Neutron and, and kind of OpenStack and VXN in general that can kind of be food for thought for the future? So um, the, the kind of overview here is I want to talk a little bit about VXLAN, give a quick refresher for those who aren't familiar. How, how many of you are, are familiar with VXLAN? Show of hands. All right, there we go. Um, and, and, you know, obviously talk a little bit about why, why VXLAN might matter to you and why you might consider running it within your network. And then I want to go through kind of what are the, the network design requirements, you know, what, what do you need to think about if you're going to run OpenStack on top of VXLAN? Um, what are some of the decision points you have to make when running, um, running VXLAN and OpenStack on top? Because there are, there are some, some trade-offs that you can make um, in, in terms of what you can do. And, you know, finally, after going through that and some of the decisions, talk about some of the designs that exist today and, and think about the future. So a, a couple of random thoughts here. One, I, I don't really want to just talk for 40 minutes. Um, if you have questions, raise your hand, interrupt me in the middle, that's fine. Um, I'll try to leave time at the end to talk about things. And I guess, you know, as a vendor, the example is taken here to talk about solutions that Arista provides and, and with, with partners. But I think really the, the trade-offs and the options here are applicable regardless of kind of what, what solution you end up choosing. And so I, I hope is generally applicable there. So I guess the other thing to say is, you know, VXLAN is, is, is a technology that's kind of more generally applicable than just running, you know, running a, a overlays or tunnels within your, your data center. But that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm not going to talk about VXLAN for data center interconnect, interconnect or kind of how to use it for, you know, private public cloud connections, stuff like that. So let's start with a, a quick refresher on VXLAN for those of you who aren't, aren't intimately familiar. And uh, hopefully lay out some, some terms so that you actually know what I'm talking about uh, when we go here. So VXLAN is, is really just a standardized overlay technology for carrying or encapsulating layer two traffic on top of an IP frame, uh, fabric. Um, at, you know, VXLAN networks are, are kind of terminated by VTEPs or virtual tunnel endpoints. So these are the points in your network that kind of make up the edges of your VXLAN, VXLAN tunnels and do the encapsulation and decapsulation of your traffic into and out of VXLAN tunnels, kind of at the edge of your IP fabric. Um, a VXLAN is identified by a VNI, or a virtual uh, network interface. So here we've got VNI 5000. And so what happens here is if host one is trying to talk to host two, it's gonna send an ethernet packet to host two's MAC address. It's gonna hit VTEP A. VTEP A is gonna look up the fact that host two is accessible over VTEP B. It's going to encapsulate it, slap on a VXLAN header. It's going to send it over the IP fabric to VTEP B. 
DTEP decapsulates the packet, sends on the original packet to host two, who then receives it, not knowing that there was any kind of encapsulation uh, going on in between. And it's pretty standard for, for network virtualization in general, not just VXLAN. Now, you know, oftentimes it's easy to get confused about VXLAN as something kind of new and wondering how traffic flows work. And I, th I think one easy way to, to kind of dig yourself out of it is to think about how standard layer two, you know, dot one q VLANs work and then kind of apply that to VXLAN. And so obviously this is a simplified picture which is missing two basic things of layer two networks, which is learning and flooding. So, you know, how does Mac learning work? Um, there are kind of two options. One is to learn packets over the tunnel. So um, the, the basic idea here is you need to know the IP address of the VTEP behind which a certain MAC address lives. And so if you receive a packet over the tunnel and you decapsulate it, you have the IP address of the sender, you can look at the inner packet and see the MAC address, and now you know when you're trying to reach that MAC address what IP address you need to, to send your VXLAN encapsulated packet to. So that's, that's one option for MAC learning. Um, the other option is to, is to use a protocol or a controller of some sort to distribute, you know, kind of pre-distribute MAC addresses within your, um, w within the VTEPs. And this is particularly useful in, in, in a, you know, an open stack or a, a virtual environment where you, you've, you've placed your, your VMs explicitly. You kind of know where they live and you know what virtual switches they're behind. And so you have some options for, for distributing the MAC addresses in a kind of better way and avoid some of the, the learning and flooding that can happen there. But you still need to be able to, to flood packets. And, and generally, for, this is for bum traffic or broadcast, unknown unicast, or multicast traffic. You need a way to be able to send traffic out and have it flood to all the different hosts that are part of that logical L2 network. And to do that, there are kind of two different options. Um, one is to use IP multicast. So this is kind of a, a standard protocol-based way for, um, you know, if you get a packet, you don't know who to send it to. Every VNI has an IP multicast group associated with it. All the VTEPs that care about that VNI join that multicast group. And so you encapsulate the packet, send it to the multicast group, it then distributes it kind of in an efficient hardware way um, across, your, across your network. Um, but the other option is, is to do something called head-end replication. Um, this is often combined with a, a, a replication node that's kind of purpose-built for this. Um, and the idea here is instead of multicast, you just send a, a unicast packet to every VTEP that cares about that VNI. And you know, it's kind of left, there, there needs to be an outside mechanism for, for knowing what that full list, list of VTEPs is. Um, so that's, that's the quick kind of refresher on, uh, on VXLAN. If you guys want to come up, there are some seats up here. Feel free in the middle. Don't be shy. Um, so that's kind of the refresher on VXLAN. Uh, and, and the obvious question is like, why do I care, right? Why would I want to run VXLAN on my network? Um, and you know, there are a couple of different reasons for this. Uh, the most obvious one and, and kind of interesting in the context of OpenStack if you're a service provider is that you get past this limitation of 4,000 VLAN IDs for tenant networks. Um, so for VNIs, you can go up to 16 million uh, uh, IDs, which means that you can build, um, on, on a given cloud, you can handle more and more tenants. And if that's your business, that's important. Um, but even if you're not someone who, who has, you know, 16 million different networks that they need to logically separate at layer two, VXLAN still has a lot of great benefits. Um, one of them is that it kind of solves the MAC address scaling problem at the core of your network. So today in a standard layer two network, your core needs to know the MAC address of every virtual machine in your entire cloud, right? And that means that kind of the hardware requirements and therefore the cost of your core network scales as you want to build your cloud and get bigger and you eventually hit a cliff. Um, with VXLAN, you've actually encapsulated all that traffic over layer three, and so you only have to learn the MAC addresses of the VTEPs in your, in your, in your, um, in your environment, which is generally several orders of magnitude less. Um, in general, layer three fabrics are much more scalable than layer two networks. Um, you can use ECMP, you know, four, eight, 16, 64 way ECMP, build enormous layer three fabrics on top of which you can run your OpenStack cloud unlike layer two where in general you're limited to two kind of what we call MLAG or virtual chassis type um, aggregation at, your, at the core of your network. And you know, I, I think one important aspect to remember here with VXLAN compared to other kind of network virtualization solutions are kind of two things. One is that um, you only need support at the edge of your network. So you're not, this isn't a rip and replace that you need to go and put VXLAN support 
throughout your entire network. You can use the equipment that you've already bought. Um, you just need VXLAN support at the edge. And the second is that VXLAN can actually be supported in network ASICs. And this, we'll get to why that's important next. In fact, we'll get to that right now. So what are some real world requirements for deploying OpenStack over VXLAN? So you, you need VTEPs that do VXLAN encapsulation, decapsulation. Um, but you need, you know, speaking of VXLAN and the different options we talked about before, um, I'm sure that some people out here who uh, heard me say IP multicast as, a, as an option for distributing bum traffic wanted to scream and you know, run out. But people want to deploy VXLAN without IP multicast support. Um, it's kind of unfortunate at some level. Like, I, I find it sad. Like, IP multicast is great. It's, you know, it's very efficient. It's a standardized protocol. But people don't want to have to run it in their network. They don't run it today. They may not have the option to run it because they don't control the, the whole infrastructure on top of which they're running. And so we need a solution which doesn't require IP multicast. Um, and the second is hardware VXLAN gateways. Um, you know, this doesn't mean they all have to be hardware VXLAN gateways, but you need the kind of performance and, and density of physical gateways at the places in your network where it matters. And generally this happens in two different places. Um, one is uh, kind of at the north-south gateway of your, of your cloud. You know, how do you get into and out of your, your kind of VXLAN-based cloud environment. You want to be able to do that at, at kind of densities and, and, and performance that isn't a bottleneck for your, for your cloud. And the second is when you have physical infrastructure, whether it's non-virtualized servers, firewalls and load balancers, um, storage, that don't have VXLAN support, but which you want to be logically layer two connected to your, your VMs uh, within your environment. Now, I'm from a hardware vendor. So I, I imagine that there's some skepticism here, potentially. But, so I, I want to go into this a little bit more, why this is important. So, so maybe who, who wants to venture a guess, you know, like how much throughput do you think you can get or density you can get through a software VXLAN-based gateway? No one wants to guess. I mean, I'll, I'll be optimistic and say two to four ports of 10 to 20 gigs. I mean, maybe this increases over time, but if you look at what the hardware can do, you're talking about you know, our 7150 series does 64 ports of 10 gig. Our newly announced 7050X and 7250X can do 256 10 gig ports in 2RU, right? Like that, you're talking about massively different scales. And, you know, if you're, if you're talking about storage or your, your firewall or, or your load balancer, you actually need that performance. Or if you're, you know, if you're a hosting provider and you have a ton of physical infrastructure that you've been selling to customers for the past 20 years and you now want to build a cloud service, and you want to be able to sell that to your customers but still provide layer two connectivity between them, you need some way to be able to bridge the gap so that you know, they, when they want to, you know, that next piece of infrastructure, you can actually sell them a VM in the cloud but have it behave as if they were directly connected. And, and so that's where hardware VXLAN gateways really come in and, and become a requirement for truly building OpenStack on top of VXLAN at scale in production. So given all that, I want to talk about some kind of what I'll call key design decisions, right? There's no real right answer to these. It's just these are options that you have as you look at building OpenStack on top of VXLAN. And we'll kind of go through each of these. So the first is, is kind of the choice between software and hardware VTEPs. And you know, obviously, software VTEPs have the ability to, you know, are, are limitless, if I can call it that, or limited only by RAM and CPU, which generally is easily you know, increased if, if, if need be. Um, and, and so that's great. And especially given that VXLAN, part of what it was trying, what, part of what it is trying to solve is kind of the, the problem that you hit these kind of hardware limitations of scale at the core of your network, for example, in your MAC address table, and you want to be able to, to kind of build an initial network and scale it without having to have these points where you end up having to redesign everything. So this is an important piece. But I think it's also important to think about um, the fact that that kind of flexibility isn't free. Um, you know, there's kind of a, an overhead of, of 10 to 30 percent of doing the encapsulation and the decapsulation in your software VTEP. And if you're a cloud provider and what you're fundamentally making money on is selling VMs to customers, that might be really important. And so I think there's a trade-off there between kind of this, the flexibility of software um, and, and hardware, which can do, you know, greater densities, better performance, but obviously it's limited by hardware table size. So you have, to, you have to worry a little bit more of does a specific hardware you know, kind of meet the needs as you look to grow. And 
you know, the nice thing about hardware VTEPs is their cost is kind of, you know, constant, regardless of whether you use them for VXLAN or just use them as the IP fabric, because the power consumption is all the same. And so um, you kind of have the option of doing, doing either. It's really just a question of, you know, what, what, what does your network need um, and, and what sort of flexibility you need. So that, that's one decision. Um, the other interesting point about software and hardware VTEPs is, you know, at the end of the day, you need to manage your network. And, you know, I think this is different at every company, but th there's kind of your, your physical networking team that's managing the, the networking infrastructure. And there's the, um, you know, let's call it your, your cloud or compute team that's kind of managing OpenStack resources and, and, and your servers. And, you know, virtual switches fall in a funny middle ground where your networking team does need to have the visibility and the tools to debug your network in the same way as it did before, before overlays, right? And so um, one, you know, part of this is a requirement placed on, on virtual switches and, and kind of the ability to do things like mirroring and S-flow just like you would in, in, in on the physical switch for your networking team. Um, it also comes down to visibility at the physical network and, and whether you can kind of match, you know, whether you can take actions on the traffic that's potentially encapsulated and do the sorts of things you need to do by looking at the inner header. And, and one advantage of hardware VTEPs is you can kind of before encapsulation, do all the things that you, you're, you did before um, for your networking team. And so again, depending on the tools you have and how you're trying to integrate into your existing environment, um, this is an important thing to consider. So that's, that's kind of the, the software versus hardware VTEP design decision, right? So um, you know, an another one which, you know, again, I, I'm not sure that there's really a right answer here. I think it's just more that when you look at solutions, you, they generally come down to having a replication node or having every VTEP doing head-end replication. And so a replication node is kind of a purpose-built server, generally, that's, whose only purpose is to replicate bum traffic. So if you don't know where to send a packet because you don't know, you know, it's multicast, it's unknown unicast, whatever, you send it to this replication node and it is responsible for then sending a copy to every VTEP that, that cares. And so you can kind of purpose-built this thing, you can give it the right resources, you can scale it out by kind of doing an ECMP-like um, uh, 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 spreading out of flows onto different replication nodes. Um, and, and that's great, but then you now have replication nodes to manage. You have to deal with HA. You have to make sure that when one fails, you know, another one takes over. So there's, there's a management cost there. And generally, that's hidden from you by a controller. Um, and then the, the kind of head on replication at each VTEP is, well, it's nice because it's, I don't know if it's by definition HA, but, or it just doesn't require any HA, but obviously that's then putting the, the burden and the cost of replication on each of your VTEPs, which if they're in software on your compute node is maybe something you don't want to do because you want to run VMs on your compute node. So that's another kind of design decision there. And then the last one is, is kind of this question of whether you use an external SDN controller or, you know, for lack of a better term, I'm calling this standalone neutron, right? So um, this is a hard trade-off to quantify. I, I, this really depends on what are you trying to do? What's your business? And fundamentally, I, I think this comes down to a trade-off of kind of features versus cost. <laughs> so again, depending on your feature requirements, depending on, you know, what you need out of your network, you may decide to choose a particular SDN controller or you may decide to, to kind of use standard Neutron with, with the OVS plugin, let's say, or the ML2 plugin, I should say now. Um, and, and this is obviously, uh, this isn't something, you know, the trade-offs vary a lot here depending on what you choose, but, um, but those, again, this is kind of the last, the last main design decision here. So with that, um, what I'd like to do is talk about three different designs um, for OpenStack over VXLAN um, and you know, kind of look at what, what do the networks actually look like? You know, what are the trade-offs? Like, how can you actually do this today? Um, and and where, where do things fall short? Um, before I do that, are there any questions? Um, no? I said I didn't want to talk for 40 minutes. There we go. Sorry? Yes. Well, it, I think we can look at the different, um, the different designs that we're going to come up here. I don't think that, like, I'm not going to point to one of these and say that's the best option, right? I think it really comes down to a lot of different things. You know, the, the questions that I generally ask are, well, how many tenant networks do you need? And, you know, what are, what are your scale requirements in terms of how many, um, what type of traffic you're handling? Do you have a lot of multi multicast? You know, I, I think all of these come into play when you're, when you're making a decision. 
um, and like what's your business, what's important to you. Uh, all these come into play, and I think that's where understanding the different reasons why one decision or another, you know, that neither is bad, they just have different implications, I think is important. So. Yeah. Yeah, so um, OVS today and the, um, the ML2 plugin using OVS uh, supports uh, the XLAN. Uh, the, the version, I mean, you know, the NSX solution is on top of OVS. I think there are many controller solutions that make use of OVS as well. Um, the standard, uh, the XLAN solution with OVS is effectively the same as GRE tunneling. It's just a different kind of encapsulation protocol. You learn over the tunnel. Um, there are some folks who have changed this with the L2 uh, pop uh, population driver, but that's kind of the, the default mode. Um, um, uh, yeah, so that's a good question, so I'll get to that. <laughs> it's a really good question, yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, there we go, yeah. Oh, I can repeat the question, yeah. too, sorry. Um, so uh, on the... Uh, with the uh, software of ETAP, if we're going to do a full mesh, uh, what will be a scale, li a scale limitation as well as uh, the performance penalty on that? Um, so I don't, I don't think I have numbers I can tell you right now. Um, I, I think that most people agree, this was brought up in the Neutron Design Summit yesterday, that like OBS with VXLAN kind of def by default right now is not really deployable um, without kind of use of a, an SDN controller. I think that's kind of the unfortunate truth. Um, but this is getting improved, so um, I think you know for for controller-based scalability, I think some of that depends on OVS, but I think it's mostly you know what's been tested to by that controller solution. So that's um, you know it depends by by controller. So. All right, thank you. Um, so yeah, so let's go let's go into some of these designs and my my nifty uh, PowerPoint uh, you know drawings. So. Um, so the first one I want to talk about is how do I run OpenStack on top of VXLAN where I'm using an external SDN controller, I'm using software VTEPs on all my control nodes, but for the points where I actually do have performance requirements, I'm making use of hardware VTEPs. So you know, specifically in this picture, I've got you know, my core switches, I've got top rack switches, um, I've got some compute nodes A, B, and C, um, I have some physical infrastructure that's connected here to a, to a, um, you know, to a gateway that's serving as a VTEP. Um, and then I have VTAPs at the, at the kind of north-south boundary to be able to terminate the XLAN tunnels. Um, and obviously this, can, this is a, a nice drawing. You can kind of mix and match where you have physical infrastructure. It doesn't have to be a rack of physical infrastructure and a rack of compute nodes, although that's fairly common. And so um, what I'm gonna talk about here is, is kind of you know, what one of these solutions look like. Um, and in the context of Aristo, we've uh, partnered with VMware NSX um, as well as, as PlumGrid to provide integration with the SDN controller with our hardware gateways. So the way that, you, that, you, that this looks from a kind of Neutron perspective is Neutron is running the, you know, your controller's plugin. Um, generally that plugin is kind of pushing all the information to the, the controller, whether it's NSX or PlumGrid or, or what have you. And the SDN controller is then in charge of managing the virtual switches. Um, and if you take out kind of physical hardware gateways, like that's, that's what it does, it manages the virtual switches. But now you want to be able to, um, and, and part of doing that is it actually you know, pre-populates uh, uh, you know, VXLAN MAC tables because everything behind those compute nodes, or almost everything, is actually a VM, so you, you know what it is, it was placed there, you were told about it. So you can do this efficient um, uh, kind of uh, uh, provisioning of MAC address tables across all your VTEPs and, and really limit the scaling. And in these solutions, generally you have a replication node that's handling, um, handling all of your flooding. Uh, to kind of optimize that. But now you want to get physical infrastructure into the picture, right? And, and so there are kind of two things that are important there. One is, how is that physical infrastructure provisioned, right? Like tenant networks have VNIs that are chosen by the controller. You know, you, you don't really know them. You don't know them up front. You can't just statically provision this. Um, and then how do, you, how do the, the virtual switches and the physical switches that are, are playing this VTAP role, how do they share information about connectivity, right? How does how does compute node A VM green know that there's some physical infrastructure with a given MAC address off of um, the VTAP that's off of Tor 4? So the way this works is that um, you, know, you have your physical infrastructure, you've kind of provisioned that up to the, the, um, the gateway. You know, you've given 
you know, you've set up your storage with VLANs, you've, you've kind of configured all of that. And then what you want to do is, is ask um, the controller or Neutron to map, you know, for a given port on a gateway, for a given VLAN tag potentially, what tenant network does that become part of? And then by integrating that, you know, integrating that, uh, by having the physical infrastructure integrate with the SDN controller, the SDN controller can then push that information to us and tell us, okay, you need to put the VLAN 5 from this port into VNI 5000. And so that's, you know, that's kind of how this, uh, the initial provisioning of the VTEP happens. But then you need to know about reachability information. And so this is where you can actually share the information that the, the physical infrastructure learns about what MAC addresses are there, right? Just standard learning. When, when someone speaks, you know it's there. Um, the SN controller knows about where everything is in the virtual environment. By sharing that information, you can now have every virtual switch and every physical switch know where every MAC address in the system lives that it cares about. And so this is how you're able to get a multicastless um, VXLAN environment with an SDN controller. And to talk quickly about kind of how a packet path looks like, you know, if, if VM Green is sending a packet, the VTEP here, which let's say is OVS, um, encapsulates, well, so in the first time you speak, let's say you're speaking to physical infrastructure you don't know about, um, it hits that VTEP, it doesn't know where that MAC address lives, sends that to the replication node, the replication node sends that to all the VTEPs that are part of that VNI, including top of rack four. Top of rack four decaps that, floods it locally. Um, the physical infrastructure now has received this packet and responds, and because we pre-provisioned where VM uh, green lives on the, on, on the physical infrastructure, the response just hits the VTEP, which then encapsulates it back to the green VM. And so you have this kind of end-to-end -end, um, end -end communication. And in the response, we're then able to tell you know, NSX, let's say, that that's where that physical infrastructure lives, and so any other virtual switch needs to talk to it knows exactly what VTEP to send it to. So that's, that's kind of um, OpenStack with an external NSDN controller, kind of mix of software and hardware VTEPs. Um, any, any questions on that? All right. Yeah, sure. Well, so I think that's an interesting question, right? So um, right now, what, what I've described is um, virtual switches that are VTEPs and gateways that are, um, that are physical switches with non-virtualized environment behind. I think to do what you're describing, it, it's logically possible. It needs explicit support from the controller. Um, this isn't something generally that, um, that we've done at this point. Um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. So the question was, uh, if we talk about uh, compute node A, um, that VTEP could be in top of rack one, right? So you could have kind of a more general mix of physical and virtual VTEPs. And, and I think that's right. That is kind of logically possible, but it's not something that, well, it's something that the controller has to explicitly support. Yeah? Oh, that's exactly what happens, right? So the, the, when you set this up, the first thing you do is you configure the switch to say, by the way, there's this controller over there. You can figure the controller similar is configured with the gateway, and and then everything else happens automatically based on the provisioning that comes through Neutron. Yeah, that's right. I think in general, um, VTEPs don't really care about whether they're physical or, or virtual. I think there's a, there's a question of whether you try to optimize things to say, you know, are, is there dynamic stuff that can show up behind that host? But yeah, in general, VXLAN and VTEPs are a more general concept that don't care. The actions are all the same. That's right. So. Does it need to be encapsulated to transport VLANs? I didn't quite follow the question, sorry. No, 
No, so it, it, it's actually, so that's a good question. I, I drew this but forgot to say it. If you look at where like the L2, L3 boundary is, you're routed from each of the compute nodes kind of up, right? Like there's, there's, no, there's no trunk port there. But then for your gateway, you actually, the, the kind of L2, L3 boundary is, you know, for the underlay we're talking about here, is at that gateway. So you do have a trunk port down potentially carrying multiple VLANs. But there's no, there's no VLANs in, in the picture without, you know, outside of the gateway. So I, I went through this part. So the next, the next use case I want to talk about is um, how, how would I run OpenStack on top of a VXLAN environment where I do all hardware gateways? And I want to take this opportunity to make a quick plug for ML2. So ML2 is a new uh, plugin in Havana. Um, it, you know, it's, it's replacing, or it's not replacing yet, it's, it's deprecating as the new version of what kind of the OVS and the Linux Bridge plugin were. Um, this was an effort uh, across many companies within, um, within the community to try to really improve, um, you know, improve the ability to have multiple different technologies that interact, multiple different vendors that kind of coexist within the same plugin, um, and, and, to, and to provide some APIs for them to do that. Um, so the ML2 plugin, to me, it comes down to a couple things. One is the separation of the state of your tenant networks from how that state then gets realized across your, across your infrastructure. Right, so I have tenant networks, they have names, they have IDs, they have different segments. Um, and and that, you know, that's kind of a, a concept that happens, that needs to happen regardless of how it's then implemented or realized. And then how that get, gets realized depends on how, like, what you actually have, right? What vendor do you have in your physical network? What technology are you using? What virtual switches are you using? And, and the goal here is to be able to kind of have what are called mechanism drivers that can realize that state across different physical or virtual pieces of your infrastructure and to be able to swap them out if you need to um, without kind of having to change everything. So it's really trying to get away from the, the, the monolithic per, you know, per solution plugins and provide some more flexibility and choice there. Um, and so just to plug this quickly, uh, Bob Kukuro and Kyle Mestri are uh, our core developers uh, in Neutron. They're giving a talk on ML2 tomorrow at f uh, 11 a.m. Uh, if you don't know about ML2, I would definitely go by and check it out, um, especially if you're using Linux Brig Bridge or OVS today. It's, it should be a good talk. Um, sure. Oh, we're taking pictures. All right. I think these will all be posted later, by the way. So um, uh, maybe I'll. So, so what does this look like, right? So if I wanted to do standalone Neutron with all hardware VTEPs, what would this mean? So um, you know, this would be for an environment where you know you really care about the performance um, uh, performance loss on your on your compute nodes. What you know, what would you do? So your your layer two or layer three boundary now kind of moves to the top rack switches. So you have VTEPs across your top rack switches. You have um, OVS running as your, let's say, as your virtual switch. And you know, the, the, the connection now between OVS and your top rack switch is just standard .1Q tags. Um, so what I'd like to talk about is, uh, is a solution first, kind of the simple version of this. Um, and, and actually, I should say, so at the last OpenStack Summit, we talked about some changes we had made to be able to automatically provision VLANs across your physical infrastructure um, based on configuration that came in through Neutron. And we've since moved that in ML2. So the way this looks like is you have Neutron, it's running the ML2 plugin. You have the OVS mechanism driver effectively managing all the virtual switches, um, you know, assigning VLAN, or based on the VLAN that's assigned, it's pushing that appropriately to the, to the virtual switch. And then the um, ERISA mechanism driver is taking that information and pushing it to the physical infrastructure so that the physical infrastructure can build a map of tenant networks. Um, VMs that have ports on those tenant networks, what IDs they were placed on, and what compute node that VM was placed on. And so you have kind of this full view of the, the virtual, you know, virtual networks along with these compute nodes that are you know, obviously physical resources. And then on the physical side, what we do is we use LLDP and we build a full map of your, of your physical network topology. So we know kind of your core switches are connected to top rack switches are con connected to compute nodes. And as a result, we can then match the two together. And so we now know for a given top of rack switch that its port is connected to a compute node, that that compute node has the following VMs on it, that those VMs are part of the following tenant networks and have been given VLAN IDs 1234, and therefore that you have to assign those VLANs on that port. And so you know, what we talked about last time is kind of simple layer two environment. How do I get my VLANs automatically trunked? Um, as opposed to kind of the standard thing before where you trunk all VLANs everywhere and have you know, massive uh, flooding domains, bridging domains. So now, you know, a simple, a simple way to think about how you would do all hardware VTEPs 
But you take that one step further, and you say, okay, well, I've got a solution which trunks all of my ports to my top of rack switches. All I need to do is now map those VLANs into VNIs at each top of rack switch in a consistent way. So if you imagine just saying, look, for every VLAN, like VLAN 5 is coming from the green VM, it maps to VNI 5000 or 5005, um, and is then goes over the layer 3 fabric um, and goes to the VTEP where the physical infrastructure is, is, is located. Um, and then gets sent down. So you have this connectivity where everyone thinks they're VLAN connected, although you're able to take advantage of a layer three fabric and the advantages that it gives you with MAC address scaling and kind of general scalability and, and fault tolerance. Now, um, in this solution as described, we use head-end replication at each top of rack switch um, as opposed to a replication node so that um, uh, whenever a packet comes up and you don't know where it's supposed to go, you actually go and send it to every other VTAP and then you learn over the tunnel and you're able to build your, MAC, your, your kind of the XN tables in that way. Yep. So, so, this, that, so the question is, what happens when you um, get over 4,000 VLANs? And so what I just described is the simple version of saying, look, I only need 4,000 tenant networks. I'm not limited by VLANs, but I want to use a layer three fabric. And so in this world, VLANs are, are allocated you know, consistently across all of your racks. And actually, this is you know, the, the next point to get to, which is, OK, well, that's nice. but I'm a service provider. I want to go over 4,000 tenant networks. How do I do this? Um, and so uh, this isn't something we support today, in all honesty, but it, it's something that ML2 enables with some of its multi-segment support, where you can do, ra you know, I think there's some work required here within ML2. I think this is something that, that's being pushed by various folks, um, where you can do rack-specific VLAN allocations. Your VLAN is only locally, lo locally significant within that rack. So you can have 4,000 tenant networks within a rack, and a VM in a tenant network on one rack may have a different VLAN than a tenant network in another rack. And so that's where you can kind of get past this 4,000 tenant network um, uh, 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 solution. And this is something that kind of ML2 enables in some of the infrastructure that it's provided to do it in a more general way than, than what's been there before. So yeah, so that's kind of, you know, if you, if you want to take advantage of the hardware capabilities of VXLAN, you want to not pay the penalty of doing encapsulation and decapsulation at the virtual switch, this is, a, you know, this is a direction you can take to do hardware, hardware VXLAN everywhere. Uh, you know, again, back to the questions around trade-offs, right? It's what kind of network are you trying to build? How many, how many tenant networks do you have? How important is the flexibility of the tables versus what hardware can pro provide? And that's where you can make this trade-off between various solutions. Any, any questions on, on this? Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's something that the physical infrastructure manages. So the, the um, you know it's kind of similar to how we how we uh, build the the network topology map. We we know where all the different physical switches are, the properties of the switches. Sorry, yeah. So that each each switch is manually configured um, with you know with the fact that it is a VXLAN endpoint and um, a combination of ML2, our RISA plugin, and, and, the, and the physical infrastructure distributes that information. All right, so now, now the question like, okay, let's go one further. <laughs> How can I do standalone Neutron, software VTEPs, and hardware VTEPs for gateways? Um, you know, so basically the, the similar picture to the original one, but with no, no SDN controller. Like, I wanna only use um, the OVS plugin. And there's not much to see on this picture because the truth is, um, this isn't really something you can achieve today. <laughs> um, you know, it is the other thing that kind of fits the requirements for running OpenStack on top of the VXLAN uh, uh, environment. But you know, today, we talked about earlier, OVS on its own doesn't really scale well um, without an SCN controller. Um, again, there, there's work, <laughs> great work that's been done by the gentleman up here um, with the L2 population mechanism driver to do some of the stuff that, that an SCN controller would do to pre-populate some of the MAC addresses. Um, but fundamentally, you need, you need a way to be able to kind of take the information learned by the virtual switch and the information learned from over the, um, the, the physical infrastructure and be able to coordinate that over your environment. And this is, so, uh, this is a hook that Neutron is gonna have to provide or, or ML2 is gonna have to provide. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting area that, that potentially um, things, things could go in. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of an interesting question of whether you need this model, right? Um, you know, whether, whether you say, look, between having all hardware VTEPs and having SCN controllers, like what is the need that that's filling? And, and so that's an interesting question here. But, um, but yeah, so this is kind of the third model and, and, and where things kind of 
break down if you, if you really want to try to do this at scale in production. And the other thing, and this is kind of true generally, you know, I think one of the things that's a little bit missing is a, a general model for VXLAN gateways within, within Neutron. Um, you know, the NSX uh, solution has uh, an extension that does this. I think it kind of just needs to be generalized. So you can take these actions to be able to dynamically add and map physical infrastructure into your virtual environments. And you know, some of you may, may be saying, well, this seems kind of similar to Ironic and some other efforts that are going on within the community. And I think there is some overlap there. And so this is an area where I think things will probably evolve over time. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think we have a few minutes for questions. And uh, you know, again, really appreciate everyone coming and standing in the back. <laughs> um, and, uh, and yeah, any, any questions for folks or for me? Yes? Yeah, so the, qu the question is, how, how about if you have an open source SDN controller? And I, I think the same model as applies in the first slide or, or the first diagram applies there. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that the thing that's missing right now in terms of, well, open daylight is not really deployable right now is part of what I was focusing on. I think that is a direction where things could go. It would need to have similar things that Neutron has today or, or some of the SDN con other SDN controllers have, which is the abil this ability to kind of map in gateways and, and have both virtual and physical uh, VTAPs, but there's nothing fundamentally, you know, I don't have anything against that, right? It's, it's, uh, it's just talking about what could you do today. Um, yeah. I think similarly, you know, there's the Ryu controller and other, other controllers that do, um, in a more open source way, this kind of VXLAN uh, orchestration. And part of this is the, the, the hardware encapsulate, or the hardware piece that's missing. Uh, yeah. yeah. I've got a, a mic coming to you there. Where does uh, VXLAN stand with respect to IP version 6, both for virtual machine and for the host themselves? Is it transparent? Yeah, so uh, the VXLAN spec itself does not, um, does not say anything about IPv4, IPv6. I think you know, the encapsulation could, could be sent over either of them. Um, someone yeah. else will probably have to answer whether OVS supports this. Uh, we, we personally at Arista do not support this in our hardware gateways yet. Um, but uh, I think as a, as a standard, there's nothing preventing it. Um, yeah, but, but is it true also for the host themselves, the hypervisor themselves, for communicating between the hosts? Uh, again, I, I think there's nothing preventing it. I, I won't say that it's doable today, because I, I just don't personally know. But I think, you know, I think this is something that's probably easily add a, add a, addable, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, obviously, there are some, you know, maybe there are scale issues, or I mean, there's certainly more state to carry to a larger address and all of that sort of stuff. But. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, you can wait for the mic. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, with regard to the um, future work on the Neutron um, directly control the VTAP, yeah. uh, it seems that the Neutron needs to take over some of the functionality of the SDN controller, right? To, yeah, yeah to and that's, I mean, I think that's part of the question that, that, that is out there, which is like, should Neutron do this? Yeah. <laughs> right? So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, again, it's not doable today. I, I don't think that it's an insignificant amount of work to get there. And I think between the other two solutions, you have some good options there. And between open source SDN, controller, SDN controllers, as was mentioned earlier, um, if those evolve to the point where, um, where they can do this, it kind of becomes less important for Neutron to do it itself. So I, I certainly agree with that. Um, yeah. Thanks. So I think we're out of time, and I'm going to have to cut this out off. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, and feel free to come up and ask questions afterwards. <laughs>